Well, hello. It's Andrew Doubleday here yet again. We're coming up to Sunday the 14th of March. And again, I've had concern expressed about the length of these homilies. They're really sermons. They're shorter than I would normally preach if I were preaching in a church. It seems that doesn't translate terribly well to the online format. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to do the whole the whole sermon. It is a sermon, uh, and there'll be three sections to it, and I'll post the whole. But I'll also post the three separate sections, so that you can pick your own poison if uh, that's what you want, or for the stout of heart, you can watch the whole thing. We're starting with the reading, which is John chapter three, verses fourteen through to twenty-one which involves part of Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus, which I referred to in our last week's uh, message. And it involves also the Gospels commentary, which follows. It probably has what I would think is probably the most well-known and for many the most well-loved verse uh, in this part of the scripture, certainly from the part of the church where my roots are in. So let's read it. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not have sent his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in all that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. In part two, I want us also to observe that we are told that God so loved the world. This is the cosmos. This is the whole of the created order. It's easy to imagine that God only loves people, and those people are people who are like us, people who look like us, believe like us, behave like us, practice the same value system as us, pray like us, go to the same churches as us. What kind of God is that? It's a God created in our own image. This God of the Gospels loves all of us, just the same, without distinction. This God also loves Muslims, loves Sikhs, loves Hindus, loves Buddhists, loves agnostics and atheists. This God loves Catholics and Anglicans, Presbyterians, Methodists, members of the Assemblies of God, of destiny, of arise, and whatever denomination and non-denomination we call ourselves. Hard though many in the USA may find it to believe, God loves Democrats as well as Republicans. And in our own country, God loves both national and Labour supporters, and Green and New Conservative supporters. I know, who'd have thought? It really is hard to believe, isn't it? We kind of imagine that God is in our corner because we believe that we are in God's corner and our corners are mutually exclusive. For many of us, here's the issue, it's about what we believe. We have a narrow view of faith. Yet I want to suggest that so much more than giving mental assent to a set of propositions. It seems to me that this is a very limited and Western view of belief. 
The Greek word used in this text, the verb pistou, means so much more. It's not just about what one believes. Now, I have a confession to make. I often have difficulty with believing in the intellectual sense. Paul describes this tension well. The gospel of Christ crucified is foolishness to the Greeks. To the intellectual mind, it seems like an absurdity. But this word used for faith, for believing, has an equally strong sense of trust. And, as one of my resource texts puts it, with an implication that actions based on that trust may follow. While sometimes I can feel a little wobbly on the supposed facts of what Christianity stands for, I know that I can trust Jesus. That, as have countless millions before me, I've discovered a transformational power in trusting Jesus this one of whom the Gospels testify. Again, what I've discovered, as I said, as have countless millions before me, is that the Gospel works. It's a power that has brought me a large measure of freedom, freedom from guilt and shame, freedom to grow increasingly into all I'm destined to become. It's a freedom that has empowered me to step out of the grandstand as a spectator on life and into the arena as a more active participant in it. It says I've learned to trust Jesus, that this love of God has grown in me and has increased my confidence that God is profoundly at work in this world for our good, not primarily to judge us, but to grow us into the fullness of our humanity, both individually and corporately. It's when we recognise that God loves the whole world that we start to realise that we're all in this together. That we're all made of the same stuff. That we're all called to live and to love and to seek the highest good of all. This is the heart of believing. It's a believing in rather than a believing about. It's not simply giving mental assent to a prescribed orthodoxy and judging who's in and who's out according to an arbitrary line that we might draw. It's about discovering those and working most collaboratively with those who seek the well-being of the whole, who are committed to loving, to forgiveness, to reconciliation, to healing, to accepting one another in our differences. Those who are committed to Jesus' kingdom of God, that kingdom of God way, where there are no firsts and lasts, where all are included, valued, honoured, where all are diminished when one is diminished, where all are lessened when one feels unable to contribute due to the judgment of others. And God's love for the whole cosmos is not just anthropocentric. It's not just about human beings. It's about the whole created order. This is what the cosmos is. That's why our environment is so important. The first five days in the creation story are given to the creation of the created order. At the end of each day, God declares it good. Only on the sixth day does humanity appear. And the creation story goes on to give humanity a role of stewardship for the care of the creation. That which was brought into being over the previous five days. There is an interconnected interdependence between us that cannot be ignored. We are charged to be caretakers of the world that God has created. This cosmos that God loves and gave his one and only son for. It's the one that we live in. It's this world. God bless you.